Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Okie doke. <laughs> Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And today is episode 130. Good God. Hard I know. I know. And what we're going to be talking about today is how to present ourselves in the therapy room and does it really matter? Well, they're good topics as well. Yeah, I think it's a really good one, this one. Right. So, let's, oh, God, I've talked forever about this. So, how about you start for a moment? You start. What do you think? I think I touched on this in the last podcast about what my perceptions are of a professional psychotherapist and what they should be and whether I meet that criteria. And I don't think I do. (laughs) So what's a, so from your frame of reference. Yes. Do you remember back when you went to see your first psychotherapist? Yes. Ever. Ever. Right. So do you remember what they were dressed in or how they presented? Yeah. Yeah. How did they dress and how were they casual? Were they dressed in a suit? Were they how were they how did they present? Do you remember? More mature, I would say, than what I do. My first supervision was in a suit. Yours? No, no, when I first went to a supervision, um, Mm. they were in a suit and very professional looking. Um, Mm. but my own personal therapy. Yeah, just mature, what I would say a mature person would look like. <laughs> Smiling because I have no idea <laughs> a mature person would look like. <laughs> so I'm smiling because I really don't. It, I, it, see, this is what I think it's about. I think this, uh, and this is why I asked the question. Um, it's horses for courses in a way. Yes. Um, in the sense that... Uh, a good friend of mine came over his, the other day, uh, our daughter's godmother, Josie, and we were talking about the class system in the United Kingdom. And she comes from Mauritius. What a lovely and, place. Uh, she spent she spent about 30, 40 years here, but she, she came over from Mauritius when she was about 20. And we were talking about that, and she asked me, were your parents, which class did they come from? Yeah. The parent, my adopted parents that brought me up were very upper, upper middle class. My um, Josie's parents were very lower class, if you want to put, even though it's in Mauritius. Yeah. By that standard. And then my wife's would be working class as well. Yeah. And I don't know anybody from the upper class, but I do know from those two classes. Now, I think. How you're brought up with the values of the class system will determine what you project onto other people in terms of what you expect. Yes. I believe, generally, in most things. Yeah. We we have an internal frame of reference which comes from the values and belief systems usually that we're brought up in. Yeah, um, I can agree with that. Yeah, so I think the sort of that's why I said it's horses for courses, because I think you will project on what you expect from a therapist or a professional, whatever, from your values and systems from the class system you've brought up into. So, having said all that, lots, um, I think uh, people will project onto what they expect from the first therapist according to their histories. Uh, so from my history, I expected somebody fairly casually dressed, somebody who spoke quite well, somebody that probably had double degrees, somebody who, um, well, you say mature, I didn't think a mature went into it for me, but it was certainly, they wouldn't be um, slovenly dressed. They would be people who didn't speak very well. Yeah, They would be people that... Um, 
you know, didn't have a sense of decorum. So, you know, those upper class or upper middle class values probably were so, so instilled in me that I would project that way. Where are you on that now, Bob? <laughs> I've had a lot of therapists now, so I don't really ha I have that so much. But I would, I think I still expect any therapist that I work with to not, um, you know, have a sense of, you know, I'd want them to have a sense of decorum. I wouldn't want them to be uncouth or slovenly or um, smell uh, bad breath or something like that. Yeah. I'd expect to have a sense of appropriateness in how they were. It's interesting. It's an interesting topic, isn't it, Bob? I'm just thinking about the people that I was in the group with when I qualified and whether I would... There was some people maybe upper middle class in that because they used lots of big long words <laughs> but yeah it's just really interesting yeah you see uh if we take the theory that we enact out our history then the values beliefs from our parents or people who brought us up would be so instilled in us or might have gone against them but yeah. you take a usual frame of reference, then we would probably expect our therapist to fit into that. Yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. See, when I mentioned this to Steph, I said briefly, he didn't really say much at all, but I said, I'm going to talk about this podcast. That's my wife. And she simply said, oh, uh, I wouldn't want somebody who's slovenly dressed or inappropriate or, um, you know, she also said, she just wanted them to have good hygienic habits and things like that. So she had a clear vision in a way of what she would expect, I think, though I had, didn't have a long time to talk to her before I came on this podcast. In a way, I didn't really think about it in terms of presentation of dress sense or appropriateness or values. But I do think, as I'm talking to you now, um, that it would fit into my significant other's values that I came from yeah I'd expect my therapist by the way to be more knowledgeable than me and this is my parents would put on to me yeah I'd expect the therapist to be as I said very appropriate be able to speak well have good diction have tri double degrees all these sorts of things that, my that parents scares me Bob when you talk like that That's because I'm, I'm a psychotherapist and I have none of them <laughs> yeah but these are upper class values I think yeah and in, and in the end the question really of this podcast is does it matter yeah absolutely well I think it the answer to that is yes or no yes and no actually yeah because if you go to a therapist that you're expecting the therapist to be a certain way now, that could come from your training, who's talk about therapists being certain ways. Yeah. It's more likely to come from your internal frame of reference, what we're talking about here. But if the therapist doesn't fit into that image, you actually might not come back. Because if we actually talk about the importance of building up a therapeutic relationship and yeah. the building of a working relationship to, so the person feels safe and secure in the therapeutic process. Yes. Then they have to come a few sessions to get used to the person. Yes. So if you turn up and that therapist doesn't speak to you in the way that you think they should do, or they weren't in your frame of reference, you actually might not go back. Or, so, and the working relationship will take a long time maybe to um build yeah I, I i get everything that you've said but for me if, if if i'm working with somebody as in a a therapist or a supervisor it's kind of like i've got to get the right energy with them rather than qualifications and things like that i need to get them if i don't get them then it doesn't matter who they are or what they do it's not going to work for me so I'm kind of more drawn to energy than all the other stuff that you've mentioned, if that makes sense. That's right. But I think it's an interesting reflection on this because does the the energy, in inverted commas, that you're talking about, 
whatever that means for you, um, fit into your the class system that we're talking about, the frame of reference that we're talking about. Yeah. Does it somehow fit into that? I don't know. It does in a backwards way, if that makes sense. Status symbols mean a lot to me in oh. my family. Yeah, yeah. So for me, in order to feel comfortable in a room, I've got to feel like that we're on the same level. If somebody uses big, long words and tries to befuddle me, then I don't think it would work for me. No. And that does they need to the... talk plain English in order to connect with me, if that makes yeah, sense. Otherwise, they're... it alienates me. That's right. And I suspect you come, and this isn't no disrespect at all. I don't know your history that much, but I suspect you come from the working class system. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that fits into the working class expectations, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Given what we're talking about. Yes. Yes. I would expect people to use long words. Yeah, I see. But yeah, literally, it, I have a physical reaction when you say things like that. But when you yeah. were saying a, a double degree, I'm like, oh, I, yeah. I I, don't know whether anybody's walked into my therapy room expecting me to have a double degree. And if they did, what they thought when they saw me. Well, I use double degree as a sort of metaphor, somebody who... Absolutely, yeah. ...who has high intelligence and usually has been to university or something like that and somebody who's highly knowledgeable somebody who's more expertise than me yeah. somebody and that's really i think an upper class or upper uh, upper middle class frame of reference yeah it's a really interesting topic this bob it, it kind of fires me up because i can remember on my training course I'm not sure whether I was the only one or there was only a few of us that didn't actually already have a degree and had been to university, me being one of them. Oh, that's right, because to get on to most training programmes now, you need a postgraduate level seven. In other words, you need to have had a degree. Yeah. Uh, the only other way you're going to get on is social work. If you've got a social work degree, degree a teacher's degree, a probation degree, or you fit into some sort of um, ex, you know, some other sort of type of bracket in the caring professions. So you're right. Most people would have the a degree or not the, or even the equivalent of a degree. Yeah. So you would probably fit into a different back, different sort of process than a lot of your colleagues. I guess, no, I absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And in your training, you might never discuss what we're training, you know, what we're talking about here. However, I bet if you had, you'd have been interested in this discussion from the <laughs> the point of where you were talking about it now. Yeah, it, absolutely. But in a strange way, I think I I I don't know how I would have felt being in that group after mm. the conversation, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, because. Uh, yes, I can understand that because you might have felt you didn't belong. Absolutely, hundred percent, without a doubt. I would have thought that I shouldn't be here. Mm, mm. Yeah, and uh, as I said earlier on, does all this matter? I think it does matter. You see, I think it matters as as a conversation. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I do think. We often pick our therapists according to the script of our history. And the script of our history will be largely played out by the people who brought us up. How how does the I'm okay, you're okay fit into all of that, Bob? Wow. Gosh, that's an interesting one. <laughs> I don't know what's behind the question, really. What's behind the question? Just what I was saying earlier on, where I, I don't think I would have felt like I belonged in the training. And if I was, you know, if, if my therapist was using big words and all that sort of stuff, I would put them way above me as in status in that room. And it certainly wouldn't be I'm OK, you're OK from my point of view. I'd expect you to stay then, would you? No. <laughs> no. 
That's what I've just said. But it's a big thing for me in the therapy room that it is, I'm okay, you're okay, and we're both on a level in in that room. Yeah, so I think most people who come to therapy jack their own scripts onto the therapist. Now, as you know, I, we've had a podcast once before about is the therapy a middle class profession? Yes, yeah. Okay, uh, and we were talking about it, and I think it is. Yeah. For lots of reasons. And, and one of them, of course, is the recruitment of psychotherapists are usually people who come from middle class professions probably been to university or have the, that type of education uh, and I suspect they do have certain expectations and projections about therapy. Yeah. How does that fit into I'm okay? Well, it's interesting because if we go to where your clients that come into you, they probably have middle class backgrounds, I just suspect, do they or don't they? I don't know. As you were talking then, I was just thinking, rather than looking at it from my point of view, and I, I would feel going into a room with somebody, what class are the majority of my clients that come to see me? And they're a mix, to be honest. I see somebody that's, you know, very educated and they've been to university and, and you know, th their job is, they're an architect, but a an affiliate architect or something, they're quite high up in what they do and, you know, lecturers and school teachers, but then also other people that I would class as the same class as me. Well, trainees, well, not just trainees, but I think I think a lot of people would project, um, you know, when they're going to therapy, um, what they expect from a therapist in terms of what we've just talked about you know having degrees having because it takes a long time to get trained as a psychotherapist and it's a middle class profession so they would expect their therapist probably to be or to come from a middle class profession so they would project that onto you before you even begin yeah now the fact that you don't may or may not come over. People may or may not ask you that. Um, but I think that would probably be the projection. Now, it doesn't mean I'm correct. It's just... The, it's a really the, interesting I, topic. The conversation. Yeah. I think that. So because... how many people can afford that aren't middle class? Yeah. Can afford therapy anyway? Yeah. Therapy starts off anywhere from 55 pounds, 50 pounds, upwards, an hour for therapy. Mm. That's going to be 200 pounds a month if you go once a week. How many, if, they're going to be well-paid, welcome people that come to therapy. So they're going to probably project onto you anyway. Yeah. That frame of reference. Yeah, it's really interesting because even just you know the, the, w taking out the class system and, and education and all that sort of stuff but the way that we look I know we've had this conversation I don't know whether you remember it way back when I was doing my training about business cards and I've always put a picture of myself on my business cards oh. and you instantly said that that's not something that you would recommend doing because people, you know, automatically make assumptions about you and everything. Mm. I still put my picture on my business cards now. <laughs> well, it would have been, I would have said it was my personal view. You did, absolutely, people yes. People put their pictures onto their business cards and it may or may not work for them. I simply said I don't, simply because I think that people or we'll see people's photographs and they will project onto them whatever so but for me it's really important that i know who's going to open the door at the other end <laughs> how would you know who opens the other door on the end i don't understand because if there's a picture on a business card you know if i was the client going i would know oh, who was going to open the door so it, it that's my frame of reference that i want them to 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 see me as familiar from the get-go, if that makes sense. Oh, right, from that sense. Um, does a picture do that? 
I don't know. It does for me. <laughs> I've obviously <laughs> projected all my stuff onto onto this conversation, Bob. Yeah. I don't think it does for me. I, I never, th I've never thought about it in the way we're talking now, particularly. Or perhaps I have, but anyway. It, no, would I want to? Would hang on. If you had a friendly picture rather than a severe picture, would I likely? <laughs> Would I be more likely to go to the friendly picture than the projection of a severe picture? Probably in the end. It's an interesting thought, though, isn't it? But you know, when it you have your. Mean, but it doesn't mean, in terms of what we're talking about, middle class and stuff like that, because you can have somebody who's very friendly and not fit into your frame of reference at all. Absolutely. Yeah. Unless, of course, you're stroke, stroke starved and you need somebody who's going to give you lots of strokes and be friendly yeah now, that's okay by the way and might help the working relationship deepen faster um does all this matter i tell you what i still say it does all matter because uh of what is needed which is a robust working system between the therapist and the clients if the therapist, for whatever reason, doesn't fit into the frame of reference of the client, they may or may not come back. Yeah. Or the working relationship takes a lot longer to to strengthen. Yeah. You see, I think they'll not like to come back because if you went to a therapist that um, had a conversation full of long words and, and on their... <laughs> The back of the seat on the on the wall on the wall was a degree in whatever, another degree in whatever, a degree in um, psychotherapy. It might frighten you off. You might never come back. Absolutely. So, do yeah. we need to adjust to the different clients that we have? Then, yes. Would it be enough? It would mean that I do believe. The client would need to come back so that in the hour the therapist does enough to persuade the wrong word but i can't think of another one but at least to put over that they are compatible in some way yeah it's really it it, it is a really interesting topic because you know if if we need to adapt to to meet the client are we being authentically us well i use the word compatible yeah i mean i said to to the yeah okay i'll still stay by that but let's go back to what i think is another really important podcast we could have which we which i think we may or may not have had by the way is does the client by definition, always adapt to the therapist, therapist. And is that a bad thing anyway? No, that, and that, that could be just another another podcast we have. Yeah. But I actually, I if I was doing a podcast on this, I would say, oh, well, I think clients by definition will always adapt to their therapist for quite a while. Until... I was thinking the opposite. I was thinking the therapist adapting to the clients. Well, both. Yeah. Okay. I just but, find it a really interesting <laughs> conversation, Bob. I think the I think the therapist is more likely to to be themselves because they probably feel they're more in a secure place within the power dynamics. Probably they might be, you know, more in touch with their adults, so they've got more chance perhaps to be that um in their adult. And if they come from an integrative psychotherapy as I do, and attunement would be very important. Mm. So they may adapt in the seek in the search for attunement to get some level uh of connection for a therapeutic relationship. Yeah. Is that the same as adaptation? Interesting. Yeah. But I do think clients adapt, they're much more likely to adapt. Yeah. It, I think, it's a different I think, world in the therapy room. It's such a unique experience, what actually goes on. I'll tell you why I think clients adapt much more than the therapist does. I'm not saying the therapist doesn't adapt yeah. because they're searching for attunement. 
and yes. assess the next. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But buyers far more likely to adapt because they're usually frightened. Yeah. In other words, they they're usually moving into a, um, a place where they they're going to therapy for the first time, and the level of scare, or apprehension, and they feel probably more out of control, is a place where the client will probably over adapt to compensate for all that, and then the therapist's job is to help the client be feel more secure in those early sessions yes yeah but uh, an, a, an interesting podcast which i think i really would like to have would be something like this is there ever any reality in the therapy room Ooh, Ooh that's a, that's a deep one bob are we I'm just right, being... i'm writing that down are we just seeing what we want the other person to be anyway? Wow. I'm off the top of your head, what's the answer to that? <laughs> it's a long po long podcast. I don't think it's an yeah. easy question to that. But I think people have to stay in therapy quite a while to work through those levels of adapt adaptation to get to any sense of authenticity where they can actually see the therapist as a real person yeah and maybe vice versa yeah because i think clients do come with a certain expectation of what what you're going to be like or what therapy is going to be like mm -hmm. and what about the various disciplines from psychoanalysis right the way through in the humanistic tradition to client-centered counseling where quite often it's trained or drummed into the trainee or new therapist depending on their model they come from not to share anything about themselves mm. so actually all that's left is the client's projections yes yeah and does i want to say does that work well in a therapy session i don't know it's an interesting question because you've had years and years of psychoanalysis built on that and in the client-centered world also you know, counsellors are trained not to share themselves either. Mm. Now, now, or or I might do, you know, some training as a disservice where that's talked about a lot more. But, you know, counsellors often, if they fall back on their training, um, don't share themselves that easily. Yeah. See, I think I'm okay in the therapy room sharing if it's for the good of the client. And I always check in first if I'm okay to share something that I think might help or is relevant or whatever it is. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I didn't connect very well with person-centered counselling. <laughs> you see, I, you know, I think it, all this is really important. I Going back to the title of the podcast, does it, any of this matter? Well, if I, if I, I don't work, as you know, individually, clinically anymore, even though I do some group therapy sessions. But if I'd have turned up to some of my clients in my, I don't know, my uh, Manchester City outfit, for example, or uh, and, and I started lying down in the client sent in the actual rooms, or, or any of these things, would that matter? Would it actually benefit the therapy? Because they'd see perhaps a sense of humanity with the therapist. Oh. See, I, I can I can picture you doing that at certain times, Bob, just to yeah, mix things up in the therapy well. room. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I did do lying down quite often uh, to do exactly what Maybe you not on the first initial session, but I can Maybe see you. I'd have yeah. to have you really knew me well. Yeah. Um, so, I, but... I think it all does matter, especially at the beginning. Yes. Because you need to get a sense of a working relationship going where the client um, has a deep enough, deep enough relationship with you to stay in therapy. Yeah. And to go where they need to go to. Yeah, absolutely. 
it's an interesting conversation to have with a client you know am I what you expected or or something at some point to you know to see yeah well I have had that conversation many many times and usually they say no yeah not what I expected at all uh but then as time went on and they heard rumors about me or knew about me or whatever it is then I turned into be the more eccentric person they had expected me to be but, <laughs> <laughs> but stroke and I do think there's a lot in frames of reference congruence and what we're talking about here so that the client stays around long enough to have that therapeutic relationship and hopefully both of you see each other a little bit more in a real way yeah yeah, but you know, because that is what this podcast is all about is, you know, to, to pull back that curtain behind the therapy room and, and see what actually goes on in there. And I think as a therapist, I want to do that with therapy generally anyway. Yeah. Okay. So here's another one. So if I put on a suit, I've only got one. I easily had the last time I had that was my daughter's wedding probably another suit for a funeral or something like that. But if I put a suit on and a tie on, and that became my sort of regular uniform for seeing therapists, sorry, clients, I would have felt so uncomfortable. Mm. And would I have been effective as a psychotherapist because I felt so uncomfortable? I think I wouldn't have been able to do therapy well. Yeah. I'm with you I on that. Felt no. comfortable. So that's the other thing I wanted to say. I think the therapist needs to present, if we put it, want to put, put it that way, in the way that they are comfortable with. Yeah. So there's a sense of realness in the process. If they attempt to dress the way they think they need to, to try and make the client stay, it won't work. Because they'll feel uncomfortable. Yeah. See, so if you see, feel uncomfortable, I know people, by the way, who did therapy with suits all the time. I know people, friends, and very good therapists who had bow ties and goodness knows what because it fitted into their upper class backgrounds. I know were very successful therapists. Don't get me wrong. Could and they felt comfortable in that. They will feel very uncomfortable in corduroy trousers or casual attire or whatever you want to say. But because they felt comfortable, they're more likely to be real. And because they were more likely to be real and feel uncomfortable, clients would stay with them longer. Yeah, I I understand. And I think that is a big thing. See, you were talking a lot then about, you know, comfort and being comfortable. And I would use that to describe you when you were saying, you know, about wearing a suit and a tie. I would describe you as a comfy jumper. And that's how I feel when I'm with you, that I could, I could share anything. I wouldn't feel judged or hmm. you know whereas if somebody sat there you know sitting upright with a, a shirt and tie and a suit on hmm. I would instantly feel like I was being judged that's a really important thing in it but and some people who come from a different backgrounds wouldn't absolutely absolutely that's, that's what I'm saying it's horses for courses yeah and for me I I dress very casually and for some, that's okay. But for others, I would imagine that they think I'm not taking it seriously enough. Right, well, too. Or, or they could project whatever onto you. But that's a yeah. very common one you've just said there. Yeah. And I've known clients who have left therapy for exactly what you've just said, that their therapist wasn't how they expected the therapist should be. Yeah. So when you say further world, what do you mean by should be? Oh, well, you know, X, 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 and X. And do I fit into that? No, but I heard you were very good. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, because they've had some sort of uh, transference before they come in the room. So I think it does matter. I think the most important thing I would say, though, is dress how you want to dress, present how you want to present, where you have a level of realness and comfortability, and the rest will follow. Yeah. If you do it the other way around, I don't think it'll work well. No. 
What a very interesting podcast, Bob. It's a, it's a it's a discussion I didn't have much in when I trained people really, uh, and certainly not in my training. But it, it it fits into script, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. The idea of script being you know, we enact out our histories. Yeah. Jacked out our histories, and then we followed them for like a tenacious whatever. Yeah. And unless we can change our scripts, uh, cure isn't likely to happen really. Yeah. So it does follow script theory. I didn't ever train this way in this discussion in the weekend on script, but now I wish I had. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting. Well, again, Bob, it's one of your it's the topics that you come up with. It's a really good topic, and the the next topic I feel is, you know, on a par with this one, which is are some feelings more acceptable than others in the therapy room? Very interesting. Yeah. So until next time, Bob. Bye bye. Speak soon. You've been listening to the Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.